Well, it's another day for us to have phone burning issues on our table to discuss in the beat with the beat and the hope that we forge a Nigeria of our dreams. Now, whilst the warnings had come about the situation of perennial flooding, now the Aloha Dam has been blamed for the imminent floods in Borno and Bochi states. Now, we hear this morning that over a million persons have been affected despite rescue efforts. And we're now joined by a security analyst, Dr. Steve Okori, to look at this and other issues in the news. Hello, Doctor. Good morning to you. Yeah, good morning. Now, Doctor, looking at the reports we saw as published by the dailies, mm. uh, over a million persons who have lost their livelihoods, the death toll we hear has crossed over 37 and has left over 400,000 people displaced. Mm. Now, we've seen efforts from the Nigerian army and NEMA. Well, persons continue to ask, do we need to wait for these perennial issues of flooding to hit us devastatingly so before we approach it from more of a reactive than a proactive point of view? Well, let's get your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, uh, first of all, my, my sympathy to uh, the affected and uh, my condolences to the families of the dead as a result of this uh, uh, natural disaster. Uh, you see, some of these uh, incidents are, are unforeseen, you know. For instance, there's this report by uh, Nate, uh, Nemes, Nimes, yes. Nimes, yeah, about, you know, the way Amanda the rains were going to drop. Uh, I won't just blame the agencies of government completely because uh, this is what we call a force majeure. Uh, is natural. You can't stop the rains from dropping, uh, you, and you cannot completely blame it on a poor drainage system. You know, the way Amana the rain dropped in the last couple of uh, days and weeks. Uh, the best they can do is what they are doing now. You know, and uh, we just hope that uh, the data representation is uh, correct: the number of dead and uh, the number of uh, displaced persons. You know, so that. Uh, they should know they, they, they will know that they are actually working with the correct data uh, it's not, just the way i said it's a natural disaster N N N this natural disaster has also captured what the newspapers are saying is chaos in midugri mm. as the flood waters also affected the correctional service uh, center mm -hmm. and we're being told this morning that over 286 inmates are unaccounted for exactly, exactly. yeah uh, at this point in time people are scared that there there might be some high-level criminals at large as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what best efforts can the security operatives take at hand to probably trace this escaped inmate as a result of the floods? Now, you see, um, if you go to look at uh, the correctional center in uh, Medjugorje and look at the year it was built, you discover that uh, it's high time for such uh, uh, structures within the center there to be corrected or fixed. Uh, we saw where there was also a, 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 a natural disaster flow, as a result of flood in Suleja prison where the perimeter fence fell. Yes. yes. And up to now, as we speak, the correctional service, they are still looking for the inmates that escaped from there. Uh, you see, I keep saying that when uh, either ministers for uh, interior, CGs, for all these agencies of government, when the assume office they should have a vision you know look at the because i want to believe that they have uh, the the institutional memory of where they've been working so they know some of the inadequacies and some of uh, certain things that they need to fix as sieges you know so that they should try and see that they have a vision towards that as they exit their office at the end of their term there should be a legacy that uh, uh, nigerians can look at and say, so, okay, while this man was in office, this was what he did. So if you go to look at it now in the Medjugorje issue, you, I'm pretty sure that you you see that uh, the perimeter fence had been there for quite a while, and uh, one would expect that there should be uh, a new perimeter Some fence. You know? Yes, exactly. Concrete walls, you know, around the, the correctional centers, because uh, these are things that we expect that they should have put in place before 
uh, all these uh, natural disasters that are befalling the, uh, the country. So that is for even from the angle of structural integrity of the fence, we can be sure that uh, it's impenetrable. Exactly, you know. But I I want to believe they told us when the Suleja issue happened that uh, they have um, a recovery uh, framework or mechanism how to recapture uh, inmates when they escape from correctional centers. So. Uh, I don't know how effective that is, because if it's that effective, we won't be still talking about uh, the inmates that escaped from Suleja prison, you know. So I, I hope that they will apply the, the recapture mechanism to see how to recapture the over 200 that has left. But uh, just the way you said, it is going to be, uh, you know, when inmates, when people are sent into correctional centers, the crime they committed is different from the kind of people they are going to meet in, this, in the center. You know, so if they, if they commit a very mild crime, for instance, and they got in contact with hardened criminal. hardened criminals, they try to influence them. So that's the irony about the whole thing. As they are out now, it is still a, a an issue of security concern. Absolutely. Now, whilst the angle to this story has largely been from the amounts of damage caused by the catastrophic floods in Meduguri State. The next set of papers highlighted some of the positives in terms of the amount of persons that were rescued. We're told by the Daily News Hub that over 719 persons were rescued from treetops and high-rise buildings in Meduguri. But the challenge here is the health alert as issued by the Nigerian Center for Disease Control and Prevention, NSCDC, that has also warned about the eminent dangers in coastal states. Now, those were also captured on the New Telegraph as well. Now, from the health angle, hmm. uh, the federal government is also calling on international donors and partners. We've seen three billion naira each given to the two states and a visit by the vice president, Senator Kashim Shetima. How do you assess this in terms of some uh, relief to the victims? Yeah, you know, you expect that um, there will be health issues that will come up from here. Cholera and some other um, uh, diseases that can emanate from this and um, kudos to the agencies that have decided to give relief materials make some donations in respect of uh, the current the situations that the citizens of these various states have found themselves but what is important is that for me is that uh, the funds that uh, is being donated you know should be used for the purpose you know because uh, we keep talking about corruption in our country, and uh, it has become very endemic. You know, there's no how we we'll talk about uh, issues in this country that won't talk about corruption. So the purpose for these resources should be used, and the 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 victims, you know, the affected, those that are affected, should be the beneficiaries of these resources. You know, so they should look at their priority, the needs that they they truly need, you know, so that they can see how to make them have some relief, you know, from this their current uh, situation. Now, now, there's also an increasing number of IDP camps. We hear that nine have been situated following responses from NEMA, mm. but we've seen the Pan Niger Delta Forum, PANDEF, also lending its voice to the conversation, calling on the federal government to come to their aid with a more long-lasting solution. Uh, what would you think in terms of uh, response to natural disasters, which are on plan and on hope for, but mm. in terms of having some, would I call it substitute accommodation other than IDP camps in these coastal areas that are more susceptible to flood, do you think it's the right step to go? Yeah, and that is a, a proactive step. You know, now we're talking about being reactive, right? So when we have uh, measures that are already on ground, because just the way I said, these issues or incidents are unforeseen, you know, uh, from the moment they begin to report that they'll be heavy downpour and all that, I expect that uh, certain measures should have been in place, you know. Uh, and that's why I keep talking about people that are saddled with the responsibilities of providing these uh, uh, measures and whatever discussion we are having here should be on their toes. They have their responsibilities clearly cut out, spelled out, you know. Are they meeting up? Are they living up to their responsibilities. In Let's the talk about some of those responsibilities more in-depth. Yeah. Before now, yeah. the Lagdo Dam in Cameroon was mm. blamed. Mm -hmm. Now we hear that it's the Alao Dam that is being blamed for mm. collapsing. Many had said that there were monies budgeted to build 
a counter dam structure mm -hmm. to receive this overflow of water from the various dams in these other countries. Mm -hmm. But that project in itself has been shrouded in some of the corruption you were looking to speak about. Exactly. Now, do we approach it from an angle of a probe or does the National Assembly need to step in at this point to arrest the situation in terms of if budgetary provisions have been made for these mm -hmm. counter mm -hmm. dams mm -hmm. and if they are not being uh, constructed, who are those who are supposed to take up this responsibility? You see, when we begin to mention National Assembly when it has to do with issues of burden and corruption and uh, uh, seeing that the, the agencies of government do what they need to do, I, I think the National Assembly are also culpable in this because they have what is called uh, oversight functions. How effective are they carrying out their oversight when it has to do with issues? You see, I, I, I think it's high time that we we get off from our slumber, you know, because we can't continue to talk about issues like this and uh, the arms of government that have the responsibility are not uh, living up to expectation. You know, when it has to do with issues that concerns them, you know, you see where they hurry up to pass either the motion or the bills and all that. But when it has to do with the masses, I think the, the National Assembly is the people's parliament, you know, so I think they should focus more on the people the citizens of the country. Now we were talking about it. Now you look at the disaster. Supposing those dams were built, you know, to take care of all this, we wouldn't have seen uh, what we are seeing currently. Now uh, the National Assembly will hurriedly now set up a committee, for instance, to begin to see how to either investigate or probe the resources that were supposed to be used for that. And uh, you know, when committees like this come up, <laughs> they, they also spend their money in. Uh, in their, during their sittings and uh, some other things that they do. So I, I think uh, the National Assembly and uh, people that are saddled with one leadership position or the other, they should see themselves as servants. You know, they are carrying out responsibilities for the Nigerian citizens. So what they are supposed to be doing is supposed to be service and not what we are seeing. Now, it's a charge to the People's Parliament in light of the reoccurring flooding in parts of Bielsa, Borno, Kanu, and Bochi states. Whilst the federal government has reportedly disbursed three million naira to each state affected, it is on a call to a more long-lasting solution to prevent the devastating effects on the livelihoods of residents in those states. Now, away from that, a prominent issue in the news which we earlier highlighted on this day newspaper followed the visit of the former military head of state, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, to the Edo State Governor, Governor Godwin Obaseke, following the traditional ritual before Nigerians head to the polls, which is the signing of the Peace Pact or Peace Accord. The papers report this morning that the Edo State Governor, Godwin Obaseke, is threatening to boycott the signing of the Peace Accord. Now, the governor has highlighted some issues also linking them to the deployment of an associate of the FCT minister ahead of the Edo state elections. I don't know, are there significant reasons, despite commitments ahead of these elections, to engender political actors to embrace peace? Now, we're seeing massive deployments by the IGP as well. But the most challenging situation here mm. is the position of the Edo state governor as regards that peace accord. Mm. Let's get your thoughts. It's, uh the outgoing governor, is he running an election? He's not contesting an election. Well, he's speaking from the position of the party. Yeah, but the people that are supposed to sign the peace accord are the candidates of the various political parties. He doesn't have any role to play there in the signing of peace accord. He's the candidate of the PDP, the Labour and the APC and the other candidates that are running an election to come and sign peace accord to, to ensure that there will be peace. They are going to talk to their protesters, sorry, their supporters to, to be peaceful. You know, we go cast your vote. There's no need for violence and all that. That's the whole idea about peace accord, you know. So Governor, Governor Basaki making the statement that he, he wants to boycott. I don't think he has any role to play in that uh, peace accord signing. That's one. And the, how far, my, my worry here is how far does the peace accord signing, how, how far does it go? You know, because... We the, still see thugs on election day despite ex political ex parties ex putting pen to paper. Exactly. You know, so we see all that. We see uh, voters that have come out to come, uh, perform their civic responsibility being killed as a result of uh, political toggery. You know, so how far does the signing go? Is it that I just is it at the state level? It's more like a ritual. It's, it's a ceremonial. If you ask for me, it's ceremonial. You know, 
Because the message doesn't go down to even the politicians, the candidates that come to sign that peace accord. Their intention is different from what they are putting down, you know. So it, it goes to show the desperation of uh, the politicians uh, in this regard. You know, they are desperate. They want to get to power by all means to see how to forcefully serve the people, you know. But I, I think that uh, the signing of that peace accord should go beyond just mere signing. It's the message that we want. The message should get to the people, the voters, you know, so that they won't be scared of coming out to cast their votes. You know? Now, talking about helping voters have confidence in free and fair processes, mm -hmm. many look at it from the numeric numbers on screen. Mm -hmm. The IGP deployed 35,000 police officers. Mm -hmm. In terms of boots on ground, mm -hmm. do you think this is enough to forestall any possible uh, Disquiet, let me look use for that as a safe word, disquiet in the elections. You know, deploying troops has two uh, narratives. First of all, uh, it's to see that uh, the, the process is peaceful and they don't violence anywhere. Anybody that has intention to commit uh, one uh, political violence or the other should now begin to think twice. That's one part of it. On the other side, it's the, it amounts to apathy. You know, because it sends fear into the voters, you know, seeing uh, troops on the streets in their various communities and all that. They begin to think that, is this war? You know, they, they, they begin to think that uh, perhaps something violent incidents or attacks can come up. And that is why they have the presence of uh, law enforcement uh, agents, you know. So th that enough will scare voters from coming out, you know. So there are two ways to, to the deployment. But... Because of the political space that we have and what we've been seeing, violence at each election and all that, so it's not completely out of place for the police to deploy this kind of number, you know, so that uh, uh, there will be adequate uh, security, you know, on, on behalf of uh, the electorate. You know. So uh, it's not out of place, if you ask me, and uh, they should just do their, what they've been sent or deployed to go and do professionally. Now, talking about neutrality, mm -hmm. it is also linked back to the comments made by the outgoing governor, Godwin Obaseke, who has now accused the police of acting in the APC's interest. Uh, when accusations like that come out, and mm -hmm. we also saw a, uh, what they call them now, a super, super numero officer, who is now allegedly having been arrested wearing an official uniform and speaking to the press ahead of the election we saw a disclaimer also issued by the police saying mm. that he does not represent the ideals of the police force mm. does that make any sense to you coming on the heels of an election that is less than uh, two weeks away yeah you see um, statements like this are uh, uh but they, they can come anytime it is not a surprise surprising to me that the governor is making such a statement you know he's a politician so he needs to make one or two statements to give an impression, you know. The police, their responsibility, number one, is to see that uh, there's no breakdown of law and order, you know, prevention of crime and all that. So they must have their presence. You can't take that away, you know. So for me, it's a political statement. He, do, I, he doesn't have any proof to that, you know. Uh, I, th I think they have done their campaigns. It's not left for the people to decide who they want to, who they want to be their governor come uh, September 21st. 21st. Yes. Now, issues of the Nigerian police force and the conduct of its activities have been mirrored on the Guardian newspaper. We we'll revisit the Guardian newspaper this morning so that we just carry everyone along on what the numbers are saying with allegations of prioritizing VIPs in terms of attaching police escorts. On the Guardian, we earlier saw this editorial with the headline, Policing Amid Lean Resources, FG Spends, 131 billion naira subsidizing VIPs protection yearly. You find the infographic with the salary structure and inserted is a caption of the 400,000 policemen in the country. 150,000 officers are attached to VIPs and unauthorized personnel. You also have a breakdown of the police budget currently at 969.6 billion naira. A big uh, upward review from the 455 billion it was in 2021. But, but these issues of police escorts hmm. being prioritized to VIPs, persons either uh, appointed or elected into office, has continued to be a growing concern. And each IGP that comes into office always makes the statement that such 
escorts have been withdrawn from VIPs, but going into the year, mm. it almost feels as though it's just a ceremonial statement. Yeah, that's it. It's a ceremonial statement. Uh, you know, there are certain VIPs that are untouchable. Of course, you know. Uh, if you have, as an individual, a private media, if you have the resources to uh, get pro uh, police protection, you know it's not free. It's not free. You pay for the services of the police. You know, by a pretty, and I know that there's no, it's not receipted. There's no receipt to show for that. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, uh, you, the, with this, what you have said here, they are falling far, far below the UN recommended ratio for a police to the number of uh, citizens to protect. The UN recommended ratio talks about uh, a police to 300 to 350 to 400 uh, civilian population to protect, but not in a hostile situation like we have found ourselves in Nigeria. And uh, if you take that number from the 400,000 that we have, you have, you have, you have uh, 250,000 left, right? I don't know if uh, policing uh, government agencies or establishments or institutions, the embassies, banks, and other, you know, we have police presence in all of this. So if it's not in the VIP calculation or figure that they have, so begin to take the police that are policing these agencies of government and uh, private institutions. You know, when you go to church, you see them, you go to mosques, you see them, and other. So by the time you take out that number, from the balance of 250 that is remaining, then how many is remaining to police over 200 million Nigerians that we have? So it's a, it's a worrisome thing. And I think government of the police should see how to walk the talk. You don't just make statements and just go to sleep. You know, let us see that you are actually implementing what you are saying. You see individuals carrying about 14, 15 police officers in their convoy. What that, so it's something that, and we're not even recruiting to even close the gap. You know? now, now, where does the conversation of private security outfits come in this? Because the alternative that the IGP had mm. said was for such VIPs mm. to engage private security firms other than relying on men of the Nigerian police force. Private security firms are not armed. The private security firms are these ones that we see that uh, stand by estate gates and uh, all that. These are private security firms, or where you go to shopping malls or plazas, you see them opening gate for you. These are private security. They are not armed, you know. So a VIP in Nigeria won't want to go for a private uh, security guard or something because of what essence is it to carry a private uh, security guard? You know, I, I don't know the kind of guards that he's talking about. If so, so, so do you think by this projection, this habits of VIPs preferring police officers mm -hmm. might continue into the future? Uh, exactly. They have even started uh, taking uh, or carrying uh, civil defense officers that are armed too, you know. So they take from uh, the, the police, they take from the civil defense uh, to protect them. And there's no deterrent that the force can institute because, you, like you said, it's almost like a business without receipts. <laughs> so there's some, some profits coming in some way. Do you think that the force will have more like the will to shun this practice that is not in the best interest of the Nigerian citizens. How would they shun it? It's, they are the ones that are perpetrated, they are the ones that are involved in this. So, so do you think better sal salaries, better wages or welfare might dissuade this practice? If the officers were better paid, uh, would they still be... Uh, but in the, in the real sense of it, a Nigerian deserve uh, security protection, you know, if you have the resources to, to, to have them, you know. Uh, uh, of course, you are aware that the police created a unit uh, for SP. They call them a special protection unit. You know, so what's their duty? Is to provide the, the security protection or service for VIPs. You know, those that are in service, either elected or appointed, or wealthy individuals that have the resources to hire them. So you can't take that away. You know, I, for me, I, I think that there should be recruitment of men into the police, you know, to see how to close this gap. If we have like a, a million uh, police uh, officers, for instance, and these things are happening, and you take the 150 out of 1 million, at least we know that we still have enough on ground, you know, to protect uh, the citizens. So what is stopping us from recruiting more? I've said it times with that number that anywhere in the world, security, it's not a cheap uh, sector, 
you know, adequate resources is needed. So Nigeria has the resources to have up to one million police officers. We're talking about a, we're talking about a, a population that is about two hundred and twenty-nine million, according to the UN uh, uh, Wado meter that was recently uh, calculated. You know, two hundred and twenty-nine million Nigerians. So if we have one million police officers on ground, there's nothing wrong, and we have the resources to do that. For like the last two, three, five years, we've we'll been talking about 10,000, 10,000. What can 10,000 do? You know? And that is why we don't have uh, security presence in our very rural communities. There's need for the police to recruit. I was in the function where a commissioner of police came, and one of uh, his uh, challenges that he read out from his paper, uh, he talked about uh, inadequate personnel, inadequate uh, boots on the ground. And I asked him, Commissioner, how many, what number do you think that Nigeria as a country should have, you know, so that we, we stop hearing about inadequate, this, no, no enough manpower. That has been a, an issue for God knows how long. So we are aware of the problem. So how do we now fix that? It's not by recruiting 10,000. 10,000 cannot do anything, you know. And uh, there was this time I was in the function at the Nigerian Army Resource Center. The immediate past, uh, uh, what do you call it now, chairman, police service commission. Uh, Solomon Arasi. To my greatest dis dismay, he said that uh, uh, the 10,000 that they were trying to recruit, I think that they just passed out now or something, that what was delaying them was resources. For recruitment? I'm telling you. Resources. Now, it has also come under some sort of scrutiny, the working relationship between the Police Service Commission and the Nigerian Police Force mm -hmm. over this recruitment and promotion exercises. Mm -hmm. How best would you prefer that they get their house in order? You see, uh, these are two institutions of government, right? And their mandates are clearly spelled out in the, the law that established them. So I don't think there's any need for any of them to begin to see how to cross the bounds. You know, the police service commission is there, clearly spelled out what they need to do. And the police as an institution is also there. You know, so I, I, I only think that there's need just, just there's need for synergy. Just that's what is missing. Because there's no need for them to begin to see how to wash their dirty linen in the public. For and people also talk about the interest in terms of uh, some highly placed individuals presenting lists of those mm -hmm. who they prefer to be recruited or mm -hmm. even promoted. Mm -hmm. List of people that they prefer to be recruited that don't have passion for the job. That's another thing. They just send names of people to be recruited into the police. They didn't ask whether they have passion for the job. And this is the reasons why we see Tom, Dix, and Harry in the service doing things that are not uh, in consonance with uh, the responsibilities of uh, a police officer. You know, So there's a whole lot that uh, needs to be done. I think uh, political leadership, I, I think, is the challenge here. They, we, they should see how to set their priorities right. Well, in setting priorities right in Nigeria's fight against insecurity, earlier, also in our lineup, we looked at the Daily Times newspaper where comments from the National Security Advisor made headlines as he's calling on financial institutions' inclusion in counterterrorism efforts. Now, it has also been from the angle of those financing some of the insecurity situations in the country linked with banditry and terrorism. Now, it's also been from the angle of the call to deploy technology in tracing these persons. Bandits always come online flaunting ransom money on TikTok. They get transfers made through bank accounts. Withdrawals are made. But yet, in our fight against counterterrorism, little of this intelligence is used to actually fish them out. We'll would also look at a particular bandit that is still at large. But let's get your thoughts on the calls from the NSA in his advocacy message this morning. It's, uh, it's very pathetic. Seriously, to see what we are seeing in this country when it has to do with terrorism and financing of terrorism. Although countering terrorism financing is a very complex endeavor. Uh, you know, whatever we do, there are legitimate funds and illegitimate funds. Now, how will the agencies of the SADO do the responsibilities of identifying and illegitimate funds, you know. Because if somebody has a company registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission and uh, he does his business and makes one or two naira profit and decides to wire part of the profit to an account 
to finance terror. How do you establish that? It takes a professional to do that. Now, we have the NFIU, National Financial Intelligence uh, Unit, right? And we have the EFCC. We have banks that this money is passed through them. I think something is missing, which is synergy, right? There's need for the NFIU, EFCC, and some key government intelligence units or departments to be able to work with our banks, you know. And there's need for training, retraining for these guys to become very professional in identifying these illegitimate funds when they are wired, you know, electronically to an account where it can be used to finance terror. Beyond that, I was I saw in the news when the where the NCC now said it's not their responsibility, where uh, the videos that we see where bandits carrying out doing different things and all that that is not their responsibility to be able to establish uh, the network that they used and all. I, I think a whole lot is missing, and the National Security Advisor has a lot on his decks. At this point in time, I think that he should roll off. He sleeps because there's a lot of job for him to do. Now, now let's look at the situation with uh, Bello Turji, who is still at large. It was published on the front page of the first newspaper. The first newspaper would greet your screens as we just highlight the challenge with the deadline passing. Now you have tensions so in Zamfara. More troops deployed as bandit leader Turji's 30 million Nara levy deadline passes. <laughs> now this will According to the security agencies, this would have been uh, sufficient ransom mm -hmm. to have persons go out in pursuit of him. Mm -hmm. But despite the deadline at this moment, he's still at large. And he's one person who came online to also boast about having taken control over a military vehicle. Exactly. It almost feels as though he's invisible to the eyes of the security architecture. Why should he? Why should he be invisible? We saw in this country where a U.S. citizen was kidnapped somewhere in Niger and they brought him to one part of Bruno State. What happened? The Navy SEAL of the US came on a rescue mission, came to Nigeria, picked, rescued the, their citizen and left. Now, I, I've talked about uh, seeking for, for foreign help. There's nothing wrong. The, the, the last uh, national, security, uh, national Security Advisor, General Mungunu, was talking about national pride on TV, that the issues are not beyond us. Well, clearly we are seeing that they are beyond us. How can one single individual, a bandit, illiterate? We cannot bring him down. And it's taking this whole long a time. And you say we should not seek help. They should go and ask Navy SEAL how they did it when they came here to rescue that uh, citizen. What did they use to pinpoint where the guy was? They can. This is technology. We didn't make this technology. We didn't produce them here. We had to go and procure them. So when it comes to the utilization of it, we should ask them. They should come and tell us how to use it. If we don't know how to use it, we cannot begin to. We cannot, we cannot continue like this. Talking about national pride, when we are sinking the more, when it has to do with insecurity, communities are paying this, even in Bedouin, communities are paying these levies to bandits. They pay for their security. Meanwhile, the state is supposed to provide security for the people. And it is not, at the end of this, it is not, it's not that they won't come back again. If they pay, they will still come back. So it's a continuous thing. I've said it on different uh, forums where I said kidnapping. And all this, I'm sorry to say, has come to stay. In the last one year of uh, this administration, over one billion was paid as ransom from about uh, 29 or thereabouts states, with Anambra paying the highest, about 419 million naira was paid as ransom. My friend, his uh, cousin, about three weeks ago in Anambra, paid 15 million naira ransom. How can I? How, how can Nigerians continue to live like this? So, technology does a lot. We should see how to imbibe technology into this and see how far it can go. An illiterate that this cannot continue to 
hold Nigerian Senate in ransom. Now, the former minister, Issa Pentemi, also raised an alarm in which he said the system has failed on some of the policies that ought to help technology trace these acts of terror. Mm -hmm. He talked about the NIMS SIM linkage policy mm -hmm. and the fact that it has been somewhat jettisoned by the security ar architecture on ground yes. in terms of tracing these persons and the source of communication, much like you raised your dismay with the NCC. Yes. Uh, well, whilst we have some of these homegrown solutions, mm. uh, do you think that it is indeed a lack of political will in ensuring that they work you see we don't fire some persons are saddled with the responsibility to see that has to happen if they failed in in their responsibility why are you still keeping them we don't fire when you fire the next person that comes there knows that if he messes up he also be fired and the unfortunate thing about what we are experiencing is that we're all vulnerable we we'll see where soldiers were killed, generals killed by these criminal elements and all that. So when you are in saddled with the responsibility and you are failing to perform based on a, a, a selfish interest, corruption that you want to, how long will you keep these monies to protect yourself? We saw where the, the three four-star general was killed, uh, Alex yeah, Paddy. Yeah, the FCT as well. Yes. So what are we saying? We are all vulnerable. So if you are saddled with the responsibility and you are failing to do that, don't forget that one day you got out of there, just the way Alex Badi left, you know, those uh, the riders that were chasing people off the road when he was CDS, they weren't there anymore. So we must see that we fix these issues. How do we fix the issues? It's by the will. The will must be there. Nigerians that are saddled with the responsibility, do they have the integrity to, to do what they are doing? What is integrity? For me, it's doing what is right when nobody is watching you. You have your conscience to check you. Are they there? We shouldn't see that it's a Nigerian factor. Anything you say, what the hell? What's Nigerian factor? Nigerian factor is doing what is wrong and they say Nigerian factor. And another issue in the news this morning we saw on the Daily Sun is a pledge from the military with uh, an order given by the CDS to troops on a December deadline on Niger Delta security. It was captured on the Daily Sun earlier with the military out to ensure 2.2 million barrels per day oil production quota. Now, there's also supposed to be the inauguration of the Defense Joint Monitoring Team. Now, priorities on our national assets, crude oil, particularly in this Niger Delta security, over time is not as if there hasn't been investments. Even with the likes of Tom Polo security coming on board, we still fall beyond, behind the quota. Uh, are you in any way confident that this December deadline will be met according to the orders given by the CDS? I, I, I sympathize with the CDS, seriously. Very professional gentleman that knows the job. But some of the responsibilities that the government put on his shoulders are not necessarily his responsibilities, you know. We know what the military is out there for. They are mandated, it's clear protection of our territorial boundaries against the external aggression. Hmm? But, you know, when we have an institution that is overwhelmed, the police, and each time the police tell you that uh, they are the lead agency, when it has to do with internal security, lead agency, and I begin to ask, how well are they even leading? How well are they leading? We see insecurity issues everywhere. For me, the Niger data, the crude oil theft, more, more of it has to do with uh, uh, the civilian population. You know, because some stakeholders that are found within these communities, how well is the government carrying them along? Because I want to believe that the citizens and other stakeholders that are not on uniform are also security managers. And these pipelines, or well, this uh, crude oil theft we are talking about are in these very communities that we are talking about. So how, why how are they perpetrating the act? Nobody sees them within the community, you know. So a whole lot needs to be done around that uh, regard, you know. I, I was privileged to be with the CGS some couple of months ago, and he said, security, the military just has a 25% role to play. The other percentage is for the civilian population. So. 
I, you see, these challenges are not new. If we, if, we, if we have put measures in place to see how to tackle them long before now, I don't think we'll be having a, a issues on the crude oil theft. The number of barrel per day is going down from two billion, above two million. Now it's you, you can't you don't, you don't understand. Oh. Quite the challenge and developments in line with news as <clears throat> captured on the front pages. We have two more news topics to go through. Uh, next one is captured on the front page of the Nigerian News Direct. And it's with the concern that uh, imports are declining despite some initiatives of the government in line with the Nigerian Customs Service for zero import duty on certain commodities. Nigeria has also recorded a trade surplus of 6.9 trillion naira in the second quarter of 2024. Let's look at that publication by the Nigerian News Direct again and before we come to get doctors thoughts on it. It says imports decline as Nigeria records 6.9 trillion naira trade surplus in Q2 2024. Exports rise by 201% in one year as crude oil dominates. Tax collection hits 2.4 trillion naira up 150% in the second quarter. Mm. Now, now, a lot of persons are, are quite worried about mm. the tax drive under the current administration. 150% up in the second quarter. And whilst we're looking at uh, a decline in imports, uh, exports have also risen. Is this commendable in terms of the state of our economy at the moment? Not at all. But of course, you know that the government makes a whole lot of revenue from imports and exports. You know, So by the time you begin to see how to uh, take... Uh, jack it up to 150 percent you expect that uh, uh, the importers will begin to think otherwise you know i i, I want to believe that uh, the current administration is a, a people's friendly administration because the, the 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 president has before he was inaugurated as president he made some uh, impressive sound bites like one of let the poor breathe let the poor breathe you know, and uh, his first uh, broadcast on the Democracy Day 2023 last year, June 12th, uh, that was when the uh, subsidy was removed about a month or two, three, three days before it was, after it was removed or so. He, he said he, he feels the pain, you know. So all that he has said, let us see that uh, he backs them with action. Now, uh, another contrast in the news this morning, unlike previous calls from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, this morning on the Vanguard, IMF was urging the federal government to protect the poor from the impacts of the PMS hike. And mm -hmm. uh, as someone in reacting to that said, this is the first time the IMF is actually not advising the removal of subsidies on certain commodities which would further escalate the cost of living crisis. Yes. Uh, let's, let's get your thoughts on this. The... NPC's new price template for PMS, a lot of Nigerians grappling with it. And whilst the federal government distanced itself from the decision to hike that price through the minister, uh, how much of an effect does this call from the IMF have on the federal government who has claimed to be innocent in the new price hike? Uh, IMF is aware that uh, there was a protest in Nigeria and bad governance protests. And the uh, some of the factors that led to the end bad governance protest was the subsidy removal and the float of the Naira. They are aware of these policies. These policies are supposed to bring some relief to the masses. But rather, the execution of these policies has brought hardship, hunger, you know. And it's clear. Nigerians trek. They trek now. I know. The third, Nigeria is a third world country, right? I know the uh, public means of transportation is the only means when it has to do to when it has to do with uh, movement from one point to another. So the larger population of Nigerians depend on public means of transportation. They don't have the resources to even enter. The trek. Children resume school on Monday. They were trekking to school because of uh, transportation hike as a result of this. Uh, uh, Fuel uh, increment. The president justified the increment in China, and the minister is saying something different here in Nigeria. 
So why the conflicting uh, statements? NIPC declared profit 3.3 trillion in their last financial uh, statement, right? Some couple of days or weeks after, they now came up and said they were in debt to the tune of over 6 billion. Why these discrepancies? Why this deception? Who is fooling who? A whole lot is wrong. There's no transparency. There's no accountability. And if you ask me, no transparency, deception, no accountability, these are factors or features of uh, poor governance. I don't want to use the word bad. You know, now, the Matrix newspaper actually even talked about it and is the Afeniferi who have chosen to use the word fascism in describing the current government of the day, especially with the arrest of those protesters. As much as uh, we've seen the 10 million naira splashed on the victims uh, who were arrested, hmm. uh, do you agree with the Afeniferi? Which are the factions of Afeniferi now? Because Afeniferi it has more than two factions now. <laughs> Anyway, I, I think uh, whatever comment or statement we are making now should be for the benefit of the masses, the poor. Nigerians are suffering. You can't take that away. Nigerians are suffering. And IMF has discovered that Nigerians are suffering. The poor are suffering. You know. So uh, IMF, one of the, uh, the policies that the current administration did by removing subsidy, IMF commended Yes, they also also praised the electricity tariff hike, also exactly. advising that subsidy be removed from electricity in total. Now, they are seeing the effect on the citizens of the country. The effect is clear. So, is the government for the people or they are for themselves? So, when citizens begin to ask questions or once they want to protest, it is as a result of some of the policies of government that are inconsistent to their needs. And you should allow them breathe. Now, the, the hopes are that uh, going into the Ember months, this is just the first of three more to go. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that projections coming at December are a hike in prices of goods and more, a hike in the cost of transportation. Persons mm -hmm. are asking at this point should the government not begin to deploy some of the CNG buses and other strategic means of public transportation? to ease the suffering on Nigerians. How many can the government now deploy between now and December? Even if they deploy 2 million CNG buses, so what impact will they make? You see, when uh, you have a plan and you don't manage to see how to come out with the plan that you have, you end up messing up. These are things that I expect that would have been in place, you know, before even the removal of first subsidy. There's nothing wrong with it. Yes. And even when the president announced the removal of first subsidy in, uh, on the 29th of May, first subsidy had, there was resources to run that first subsidy regime to the end of June. Because in the budget of President, uh, former President Buhari, before he left, the budget to carry on with subsidy was supposed to last the June ending. But the man announced it on the 29th of May. And I'm pretty sure from findings that that statement wasn't part of his speech. Fuen had left from 197 naira to 500, 600. So in one year, Fuen has gotten to 1,000 or more. So just imagine the next four, three years, how, how, how much it will get to. That's 1,000% increment on what it was at when he came into office. Absolutely. So, what are we saying? The president then, uh, during his speech, would have told Nigerians that there's no uh, economic policy uh, team in place, right, when he was sworn in. We are going to see what we'll do. There will be an economic team that will be inaugurated. One will settle down and all that. You are aware that the subsidy regime was paid up to June ending. What, as a government, a government that feels for the people, government for the masses and all that. We knew how, how he, he fought for this democracy. And democracy has to do with the people. He would have made the announcement that uh, we are going to send a, a supplementary budget. But Nigeria has the resources. Supplementary budget that will run subsidy regime till the end of December, between now and December. 
we'll deploy we'll deploy xyz number of uh, uh, cng buses and other things we'll talk to labor and see how we can see how to increase uh, the minimum wage fantastic if you if would have done that then so that nigerians would have had quite the amount of time to brace themselves up for this impact Simple. how can i be buying a fuel at 197 naira then all of a sudden to 600 and something naira and you're still earning the same income there are a lot of managers that are not earning any income. So those ones, what do you expect them to do? They need to move from one point to another. They need to feed. There are certain basic human needs that they can't afford now. And we don't, and we don't have security in place where people should, can go about their normal businesses and make a living. For instance, if, you say, I have, if I have a transaction in Kadunana, for instance, I'll be scared to go to Kaduna. The money I'm supposed to go and make in Kaduna, for instance, I'll be able to make it. So if there's security in place, a whole lot will change. Now we have food shortage. There's more demand, less supply. Farmers can assess their farms. And that's why the price of goods are going up. A farmer that ran the risk to go to the farm, I end up coming out with his produce. You expect that he won't sell at the price that he wants to sell? When the demand is high, entrepreneurs that want to invest in their businesses by building factories or industries and all that, as a result, will create job opportunities for our teaming youths. There's no security for them to come and see that they want to invest in that regard. So if we take care of the security issues in this country, the whole law will change. So we should set our priorities as a government. And I... I said it in your, the, the last time you guys we spoke on the phone. I said if we have a scale of preference and we begin to itemize our priorities in the order that we want them to, insecurity should come first, fixing the economy should come, and the other things will fall in place. It is not about changing national anthem. Well, Dr. Steve O'Curry this morning sharing his vehement perspectives, and we appreciate you for the time on the program. Thank you for having me.